Let's start. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, in this session, we are going to talk about Apache Beam and its programming model that unifies batch and stream data processing. My name is Daur Bonacci. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I have been contributing to Apache Beam and its predecessors for a couple of years now. So this talk is somewhat related to the talk that happened yesterday in this same room, where you got a chance to see kind of a high-level picture what Apache Beam is, and you got to see some demos. In this talk, we'll go talk more about the technical content, more about the programming model itself. So this is a technical talk with uh, no demos and with some code. All right. So this is the sentence kind of that I would like to get across during this talk, that Apache Beam is a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. So there are three key things, efficient, portable, and unified. And we'll come uh, to argue for these points throughout the presentation. But first, let's start with a uh, very quick introduction, what is Apache Beam? So it's a three different things. Right? The first thing is the Beam model. This is what this talk is about. We are going to present the programming model today. But that is kind of relatively artificial. It's a document. It's a spec. And that spec is implemented in a set of SDKs and in a set of runners. So you use the SDK to define your data processing pipeline and then run that data processing pipeline on a runner. And today, we support Java SDK and Python SDK to define your data processing pipeline. And then we support several runners for executing those data processing pipelines. And today, those are Apache Flink, Apache Spark, Google Cloud Dataflow, a fully managed service in Google Cloud, and a local runner for testing. All right. So just a quick uh, note on the history. So Beam is a new project. It's currently incubating as part of Apache Incubator, but it traces its roots back to the original MapReduce paper. In 2004, Google published the MapReduce paper and fundamentally changed how we think about distributed data processing. However, innovation at Google didn't stop there. And over the years, since 2004, Google kept innovating in a relatively closed and hermetic system. And some of these ideas were shared with the world in kind of terms of academic papers. So the, the wider community had a lot of papers to read, but not much to play with. At the same time, the open source community came up with its own MapReduce implementation in Apache Hadoop. And this amazing ecosystem that we love was born. And these two branches of innovation sort of influenced each other sporadically at times. Then in 2014, Google started opening up its own technology that powers Google. And it first started with Google Cloud customers. So in 2014, Google Cloud Dataflow was launched. And uh, users of Google Cloud were able to take uh, the power of this uh, system and use it for their own purpose. But then in 2016, kind of, we went even a step further and moved the programming model, the SDKs, into the new open source project that we call Apache Beam. So while Apache Beam may be a new project, maybe still incubating, kind of the technology is kind of mature. It's a technology that is proven at scale, and we are pretty confident in it. All right, so that was a quick introduction kind of what Apache Beam is and where we trace our roots back. Now we are going to go first talk about the unified programming model. Of course, we start with data. So let's say that we are building, a, let's say, a mobile gaming application, and, the, and this data represents maybe scores that users are achieving on our game. Maybe our game gets popular and data gets bigger. Maybe. It gets even more popular, and then we need to start organizing our data ba maybe by days. But really, when we come to this point in time, we really have a streaming system. Uh, users are playing our game, and the results are constantly streaming in. So data may become infinitely big. It may be a streaming system that we actually need. And we, when we talk about the unified programming model, this is what I mean that we write our application once, 
and can run it on small data, on big data, on organized data, on infinite data. So I'm going to show later in the presentation how Apache Beam can, with Apache Beam you can write once and execute your pipeline in many of these scenarios. All right. But when we talk about streaming systems, the notion of time comes into play. So first, we need to talk about processing time. And this horizontal axis on this slide shows processing time. However, in a streaming system, there may be delays. Maybe people are playing our game in the elevator, or maybe uh, while flying in a transcontinental flight, and those events come to our system several hours later. So we can take a look at event that was processed around 8 o'clock. It may actually happen around 8 o'clock, but it may happen maybe at 8.30, or sorry, uh, the event that happened at 8 o'clock may be processed at 8.30, or it may be processed several hours later, maybe when that flight lands somewhere. So to be able to build such a system, we really have to think about the difference between event time and processing time. In the ideal world, all events would be processed at the same time they happened. So this, is, uh, this represents this diagonal for, for the ideal case. In reality, we will have something like this. In this case, we have some skew between reality and ideal, which represents our delays. And this is the first, the first moment where we introduce a new concept. This is a concept of watermark. Watermarks in a system define or describe pro progress in event time. Pretty much when a watermark is at this current point, we believe that the system has processed all events that have happened before the watermark. So in a sense, we do not expect to get any more events that are older than watermark. Of course, this is often heuristic based, and if we get it wrong, uh, things are non-ideal. So if it's too slow, results will be delayed. If it's too fast, some data will be considered late. Right? We cannot avoid that, but we can handle that gracefully. So when we talk about the programming model of Apache Beam, and to be able to unify all these use cases, the key thing is to separate certain considerations, certain questions into separate APIs. So we are going to talk about four different questions. First is, what are you computing? This is your business logic. This is kind of exactly that specifies what your pipeline is doing. Right? This is something that we would like to keep the same across all use cases. And then we'd like to talk about where in event time, when in processing time, and if we have to deal with the refinements of results, how, do, how those refinements relate over time. Now let's look into a couple of more details. So first, what are you computing? Right? Like in a standard MapReduce Hadoop style, we have several types of transformations. Some of them are element-wise. They take an element and transform it to another element. Some of them that are aggregating, maybe sums, they take many elements and produce one element. Or even composite ones that take some, element, some set of elements, produce another set of elements in a, uh, in a complex composite transformation. So this is the first code snippet. It's a very simple code snippet that consists of three lines. So let me walk you through these three lines. So in the first line, we read some data from somewhere. It doesn't really matter. This io.read represents reading data. We store it in a P collection of string. What is a P collection? It's a distributed collection of data. What we know about it, it's a type, type of string, nothing more. Then we take that P collection and apply a, compo uh, apply a parallel do that will take some parsing of that string. What we get out is a key value pairs of strings and integers. And then we take our real algorithm, which is summing integers per key, and then get our own sums. So this is kind of what consideration. This describes some algorithm. If we come back to the mobile game, maybe we are summing scores per user. This is the algorithm to do that. All right. We'll run this uh, algorithm on a sample small use case of about 10 elements. So here we have event time and processing time. 
Event time runs from noon to 12.09, and then processing time runs from 12.05 to 12.10. In the ideal world, all events would be processed on this diagonal line, and there will be no delays. Right? So if you look at this element number three, it occurred around 12.07, and it was processed around 12.07. So this one was not delayed as much. But this element number nine occurred around 12.01, but got processed around eight minutes later. So this one was delayed much more. So if you look at this, our algorithm, it's just a plain sum over whole of the data set. This is how it looks like. The total sum is 51. So in this case, we have a standard batch use case. We take some algorithm, apply it on all data, and when we are done processing, we get number 51. That's our sum. But if you'd like to start building towards other use cases and to support other systems, we really have to start thinking about time. And the next consideration is where in event time. So to build a streaming system, we really can't get to a position that we wait until all data is processed to be able to output some results. To be able to do aggregations, we have to divide time into finite size chunks. And concept of windowing is a standard way to do that. So we can divide event time in, in certain windows. Windows can be fixed, maybe of duration of five minutes or one hour or one day. They can be sliding. Or they can be even compl more complex windows like sessions, which we'll see a little bit later. Now, I'm going to take the same program from before and make one line change to it. I'm going to specify that this data should be windowed into fixed windows of size of two minutes. Okay? So this is kind of one key point to get across. Irrespective of how simple algorithm we might have, like summing integers, or complex, maybe training a machine learning model, this would still be a one-line change to make this pipeline windowed. Okay? We'll see this point come up later on again. So again, we have the same example as before. We are summing integers, same data. Before, we got one sum, which is 51. But now, we have four, right? We have divided event time into finite size chunks. And instead of having 51, our results are 14, 22, 3, and 12. OK. We don't really have a streaming system yet but we started building towards it. Okay. Now we have to start thinking about processing time. So we, the problem in the previous example was that results were still emitted when the pipeline completes. Right? To get a real st streaming system, we have to emit results earlier than when the pipeline ends. And triggers are the concept to control that. They control when data is emitted. Triggers are often relative to the watermark. So for example, we can choose to emit results for a particular window when the system thinks it has processed all the data for that window. And this is the exact example that we'll show in this case. Again, we have the same program as before. We are modifying just a single line in this example, and we are specifying that this pipeline should emit results for every window once the system thinks it has processed all elements for that window. Right? Single line change, irrespective of how complex or simple your algorithm may be. All right, let's look at this as an example. So first, we are going to assume that we have a perfect watermark. This is this uh, dashed line on this graph. So now, we still have the same results as before, but they are emitted sooner. Not when the pipeline finishes, it's when the dashed line crosses the end of the window. And at this point, we have built our fully fledged streaming system. It emits data as we go along. All right. But there are a couple of ideal idealizations here. First, this is a perfect watermark. Now, if the watermark is not so perfect, we could be in trouble. So let's say that the watermark made a mistake. 
and figured out that this element number nine will not happen. In this case, we got some five instead of 14 for the first element. We got a mistake, right? So we have to handle that mistake. And Apache Beam is powerful in that way that can specify that we should emit results for a window at watermark, but when we see a late element, we should refine the result. So this is the statement with late firings at count one, which really means for every late element you see, refine the result for that window. But even more, we can provide early, speculative, and incomplete results for each window. Maybe that could be beneficial for our downstream system to see kind of for long windows which value we are tracking towards. So we can provide speculative results for each window. Now let's take a peek again at the heuristic watermark that made a mistake, right? So it did output five as a result of the first window as an on-time uh, result. And then when the system hit number nine, it produced 14 as a late result, as a refinement of the result. Okay. And now the final and fourth consideration in the model is how do refinements relate to each other. If we are going to produce multiple results for the same window, how they relate to each other. And there are three uh, kind of different modes. One is discarding, where we discard certain things. One is accumulating. And finally, it's accumulating and attracting. Right? This is relatively simple. Right? So the, the key thing is uh, who is going to be the consumer of this data and whether we expect the consumer to aggregate or we are aggregating on behalf of the consumer. Again, this would be a single line change to our program to specify how do refinements relate to each other. And your algorithm, your core business logic, your sum or your machine learning model will not change. Again, the same graph one last time. In this case, we are building a fully fledged, really complex streaming pipeline that produces early results every minute, that produces uh, results that we believe is correct one, once the watermark passes the end of the window. But in any case, if we are wrong, it produces refinement of the data by retracting the previous result and publishing a new one. So this is a really complex system that we have already built. And all of this was possible with zero changes to, to the core business logic by just tweaking a parameter in this clean and separated API. So these are the key questions in the B model. What, where, when, and how? The key thing is, are these the right questions? And to argue that these are the right questions, I'm going to show you that this model is correct, powerful, composable, flexible, and modular. First, correctness, right? Distributed systems are hard. They are distributed. Skews vary. These elements could come in different orders at different times. The system is correct if regardless of this order produces the same elements. And as we have seen before, and we see in this animation as well, irrespective of the ordering of the system, the pipeline in this model will produce the same results. So event time results are stable. Hence, this is correct. Now let's show the power, right? I mentioned about session windows early on. Maybe fixed windowing and sliding windows are relatively easy, but sessions aren't that easy. Sessions represent bursts of user activity. So basically, in this case, we are specifying that we should window our data in a data-dependent way, that the window should end for each particular user when that user has not been active for, let's say, one minute, right? And then we get variable size windows, right? This is really a complex feature. Even more, window sizes may be, uh, window functions or window mappings can be user-defined. They are not pre there is no predefined set of window functions, even more powerful. Uh, for the, in the interest of time, I'll skip composability and go into flexibility. 
So I have shown you six use cases. For those six use cases, we haven't changed anything. We have written our business logic once and have supported all these cases. And then finally, modularity. To do that, not only that we didn't have to change our code business logic, each case was a one-line change. We started from classic batch to batch with fixed windows to streaming, to streaming with speculative and lay data, to streaming with retractions, and finally sessions. All of that single line change, your entire business logic did not change. So based on these things, we believe that Apache Beam pro offers a unified model, a model that can express any kind of data processing you may need and serve us for a long time. All right. So this part was about unified programming model. Now I'll try to argue that this model is very efficient. Right? We don't really need a system that is very good, can handle everything, but it's very slow. Right? So first, I'm going to show this on two examples. The first example is varying workload. Right? In a batch pipeline, they go through stages. Some stages may be more CPU intensive than others. Some may be CPU bound, some may be IO bound. In a streaming pipeline, the in input uh, wor uh, workload will vary. Maybe your uh, workload during the day is higher than during the night. It's a very common case, right? In many cases, you have to make fixed decisions. You have to provision your server or your cluster in advance. And then you come into a case that it's either over-provisioned or under-provisioned. And this is kind of, uh, you know, very common case that you are paying for the utilization that you don't need or you don't have enough capacity at the time you need it. What we really like is that we have a system like this, a system that adapts to your changing workload. And to do that, we offer one solution. The solu our solution to that problem is to raise the abstraction of the programming model. In many cases, today, you think in terms of shards. Shards are kind of portions of your data on your workers. Here in Apache Beam, we try to raise that con uh, concept up to arbitrary bundles. And user code operates on bundles of elements. They are separated from the underlying shards that may be present on your work machines. So this allows easy parallelization. It allows dynamic sizing. Right? We don't know a priori what it will be the size of a particular bundle. And then when, with this power in the model, we leave the parallelism decisions to runners. The runners know where the data is located and know how to, to separate and map bundles into shards. The second problem is the straggler problem. This is a very known problem, uh, equally likely in academia and in, in, and in the industry. So here on this graph, we have tasks. Tasks run on workers, but tasks don't take equal amount of time to execute. So work is not really evenly distributed across tasks. There are many reasons for it. Maybe reason number one, it's inherent to your data. Let's say that you are doing genomic analysis. Certain parts of the human genome are much more interesting than others. Right? The others are all the same for all humans. So in that sense, there is much more processing needed in that part of the genome. Or Another type of reason why this happens is the processing, right? So if you are doing some kind of aggregation across users, you may have users that are using your application much more often than others. These users cause hot keys. And that, those keys take much more process than the, user, than the keys for the users who use your application much less often. And these effects are multiplied per, per stage. So people have faced this problem in the past. There are many standard solutions, or not solutions, probably workarounds is a better word for the, uh, how to attack this. Maybe we can split files in equal chunks. Won't really work. Maybe we can preemptively oversplit. It works to some degree, but if the cost of the splitting is too high, maybe we are paying unnecessary costs there. Or maybe we detect slow workers and try to re-execute that worker in a, sm in a smaller shard. Well, we are obviously not optimal that we are re-executing certain portions, right? 
So our philosophy is that no amount of upfront heuristic tuning, regardless is it manual or automatic, is enough to guarantee good performance. The system will always hit unpredictable situations at runtime. Even more, a system that's able to dynamically adapt and get out of a bad situation is much more powerful than the system that heuristically hopes to avoid getting into it. And our solution to this is dynamic work rebalancing. I already alluded to bundles. I already alluded that they are of dynamic size. So in this diagram, we have some tasks. Those are these green tasks that have completed. And then we have the yellow ones that, that is active work. And there is some uh, work left for those tasks as well. We can steal a portion of the data of that bundle and give that work to another empty or you know, free or idle worker. And we can keep doing that dynamically during the runtime of your pipeline. This is a really key thing, right? So instead of your worker running and waiting and all other workers waiting while this one is chugging along, we take some work from that worker and give it to the idle worker. But we can't really do that without programming model support. And here is again where Beam programming model comes into play. To support this, Beam has two sets of abstractions. One is source and one is reader. With source, we can ask the source to split itself into bundles. And then for each reader, for a particular source, we can get the fraction currently consumed and we can ask that reader to split itself at a particular function, at, at a particular fraction. So these are really easy APIs to implement. Let's say that you are reading from a file. And if your shard or your bundle is to read from the byte one to byte n, and if the system asks you to, to split that half, you just stop reading at n half and you are done. With these kinds of abstractions, we can implement, or any runner can implement, dynamic work rebalancing. Now let's take a look at a real world example. This is a pipeline a batch pipeline that runs on 400 workers. It's a perfectly parallelizable pipeline that runs on a very simple data. It's just doing word count. It's obviously a two-stage pipeline. Here we see kind of a lot of white. White represents idle time for workers, and green represents when the workers were busy. This is the case without dynamic work rebalancing. Now if we apply dynamic work rebalancing, this is the graph we get, right? We, are, we don't see stragglers anymore. They are minimized. And then the system can start the second stage much sooner than it would otherwise. And then again, all workers finish practically at the same time. So in this case, the system is very effectively using your available resources. And as a result, in this particular case, where the pipeline is perfectly parallelizable, finishes 30% faster. And if you can imagine, if the pipeline wasn't perfectly parallelizable, or the data wasn't as perfect, kind of you can imagine many, many, uh, many much, much bigger savings. But this enables one more thing. If you are running on an elastic service in any cloud, you can usually increase and decrease the size of your cluster dynamically. And when you have the power of the B model, that can split further and further and further, you can build a system like autoscaling. So in this case, we have a, a similar graph as before. We start with just a few workers at the beginning, and then we see that there is inherent parallelism in our, in our workload, and then we spin up more workers, and then more workers, and then more workers. And then we go to a particular limit that maybe a user provides, and we are able to 100% utilize the available resources in this pipeline, and all 1,000 workers practically finish at the same time. This would not be possible without dynamic work rebalancing. So this was the argument why B model is efficient. It efficient, ef effectively uses available resources. Your workers are not idle. And finally, 
The third main thing about B model is portability. So let's talk back how, how users use Beam. So you write your pipeline in the SDK of your choice, today, Java and Python, and then execute that pipeline on any runner at execution time. So basically, our pipeline has, is not tied to the runner it runs. We can run it on any runner. And moreover, kind of, if you want to switch from on-premise to the cloud or back, or this is a really, in, really hard technological decision that takes a lot of time, money, and effort to accomplish. Here in Beam, you write your pipeline once and execute anywhere. And you can change your mind three times a day if you like with a very small cost. But am I overselling this a little bit? Of course, the systems are not going to be equal. Right? Some, of course, some uh, runners will be able to do more optimization than others. So definitely performance between runners will vary. But Beam exposes very simple concepts and very small number of concepts. If you refer back to the MapReduce, kind of MapReduce paper argues that every data processing pipelines can be expressed in terms of map shuffle and reduce. Just three primitives. Here in Beam, we have six. Right? We have six primitives, and we kind of guarantee that if a runner implements six primitives, that any more complex composite transformation can be expressed in terms of those six. And that's how we believe we have actual portability, not portability just in the name. Six primitives, and you should be able to run all kinds of complex pipelines. Of course, there'll be some more differences about batch only, streaming only, and things like that that are inherent to the underlying uh, processing backend, but th those are you know, unavoidable. But even more than that, you can take a pipeline and run it elsewhere. Beam is not focused only on end users. Those are the ones who want to write the uh, pipelines or transformations in the language of their choice. We have two more categories of Beam users. One is SDK writers, and the other one is runner writers. We expose clean APIs for those. So while today we support Java and Python on the SDK side, and uh, Spark, Flink, and Dataflow on the runner side, we produce clean abstractions so that we can have multiple SDKs in the future and multiple runners in the future. So right now we have Apache Gear Pump and Apache Apex in progress. And we will soon have those runners as well. And if history is, of, is any indication, there will be hot new runner next year or hot new backend next year. By choosing Beam, you are kind of future-proofing your code that, that that code can run on a hot new runner next year. So Beam is that glue that connects these things together and allows any SDK to run on any runner, which fu future proves your code. Of course, in the open source world, as I alluded in the beginning, we are still an early project, and we are really focused on growing the open source community. So if you currently have some kind of big data APIs, maybe those are machine learning APIs, maybe that's some kind of SQL interface, you can connect with Beam and expose it as an SDK or a DSL or a library of transformations, depending on your use case. And if you do that, you get a lot out. What do you get? Your users will be able, through Beam, to run on any distributed processing backend. If you have a distributed processing backend, you can write a runner. And that can open another cate other categories of users to you. So those that are not using your own APIs, but they're using some other APIs, they can run on your backend. And this gives you additional power. And if you are writing, or if you have a data storage system, or maybe some kind of messaging system, you can write a Beam I.O. connector. That way you can use Beam to load the data into your system or process the data in your system. So this kind of gives additional levels of portability. So the, the levels that portability will be even greater in the future. 
So now I'm coming back to my original statement that Apache Beam is a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. If you remember one thing from this presentation, this is it. One sentence, three points. Unified, efficient, and portable. Of course, visions are a journey, and we are in a, some, a pretty mature product. We are early on. We are not ready for production use today. We are ready for developers. We are ready to grow the, the community. We are ready to connect with more SDKs, with more runners. And we are ready for early kind of uh, proof of concept for actual user pipelines. But in a very few short months, we will be there. We'll be able to run uh, reliably, and we'll be able to say that we are ready for production use. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website, subscribe to mailing lists. There are a couple of nice uh, blogs here about batch and streaming, really nice uh, reads if you are interested to learn more about us. Finally, uh, I'm privileged to give the presentation today, but many of the ideas presented today are a work of so many engineers, mostly at Google, uh, and I'm just one of them that was privileged uh, to be on the ride for the last couple of years. And thank you guys for being here. Uh, it's really great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have a few minutes. Maybe a couple questions, if any. So the question is when the slides will be available. I don't have a direct answer to that question. Um, it will I'm probably be on the, be on on the, the conference app. website in a week or so. Yeah, I they should be on the app, I, I'm told. So go to the Hadoop app. OK. Uh, you mentioned all the mainline operations could be, could be decomposed in six primitives. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a formal proof for that? Or how did you get to that conclusion? So it's a more deeper question. Um, so in terms of starting from map, uh, from map reduce, kind of we have parallel do and group by key. And everything can, be, can go back to uh, par do and group by key. To support certain optimizations, we grow from this set to six. So to support something like side inputs, to support uh, windowing, we introduce a couple of more primitives. Why we are sure, right? So we expose these six, and then we build complex composites on top of it. So really, you will not be able to use something that does not distill to those six. The question may be, can you express something that you, is there something that you cannot express right now in Beam? Uh, there are certainly use cases that you may not be, but kind of the argument comes back to the map reduce and that everything can be map, shuffle, and reduce. So the argument stays exactly as it used to in Hadoop, I guess. And is there a paper for those new primitives, like how you got to that derivation? Or? So they are being shared in the last month on the Beam mailing list and being discussed. So it's definitely possible to take a peek at those. So all the code is open source. All those six are in documents right now. So it's possible to see that. Is, is there a concept of uh, intermediate serialization formats for uh, sharing between these primitives, or like the p-types or avro types mm -hmm. parallel for uh, Apache Crunch? So we store data in P collections, or we refer to data in P collections. So P collection is some holds your data, but it does not really exist in practice. P collection represents your data. Uh, so when a runner needs to, for example, uh, separate your complex pipeline into stages, the runner will typically insert certain sinks or certain write operations to write your data into temporary storage, uh, as a result of one stage and read that data as an input to the next stage. So basically, there will be an intermediary format between stages. However, 
users are never exposed to it. If you'd like something, you just use a built-in write transformation and write it wherever you want to write it. And you can consume it directly there in a non-intermediary format. So intermediary, intermediary format exists, but it's abstracted away, and users don't need to deal with it. Uh, I have a question about the window, um, window, uh, window with uh, the event joining. So, how do you express a jo uh, event joining with Windows, and how is actually implemented in any of runners? Right. So we support joins. Uh, basically, joins are implemented in terms of side inputs. So you can have one. Uh, a P collection that comes as an input, then you can have another P collection that comes as a side input, and basically for each element of the main window, we have a P collection view, so the windowed view of the side input. So you still have a projection of one P collection to the other, but again, both are windowed. It, there is kind of a deeper question about how does triggering work with that, and maybe we can talk about that offline. I had to draw you a couple diagrams to show you that. More question? Last, last question. CEP? OK, before, after. Uh, we do not have a direct abstraction to say this happens after this. There are many ways to do that. You just add a data dependent edge. So kind of it's possible indirectly. We are thinking right now about the clean API to express it directly without adding a fake data dependency, but kind of you can achieve that with a fake data dependency today. All right. I think our time is up. All right. We can take things off. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be in the streaming Birds of Feather session if you would like to discuss any more details.